You've probably been told that vintage Mustangs are known for overheating, or you've read it in an old magazine or somewhere on the internet, maybe even heard it in another YouTube video. It's a characteristic of the early Mustang that these cars do tend to run a little bit warm, but they don't have to. Hi, my name's Walter, and you're in the GT350 garage. I'm here working on my 1966 Shelby GT350, and I'm in the middle of doing the cooling system and some engine maintenance because it's long overdue. The last time this car had even a regular service was way back in the year 2000. And the last time it had a major service was 1988. So I've got a lot of work to do on this car and I've decided to share with you some of the knowledge that I've learned in the 30 plus years that I've been in this industry as I go through these systems and uh, bring this car back and put it back on the road. So this is going to be a series of videos. I'm going to break it up into smaller, shorter segments and post them as individual videos. Um, this first video, I'm going to kind of focus on the basics of cooling system operation and the thermostat in particular. Um, in the following videos, I'll cover radiators, water pumps, fans and shrouds, the radiator cap, cooling bottles, uh, recovery style systems, and kind of walk you through how all of that works. But the most important part of this entire series of cooling system videos I'm going to do is going to be the final video where I bring it all together and explain how engine tuning is probably the most misunderstood part of cooling system operation. So with that, let's get started. Where does the heat come from? Well, it's coming from the engine, but how? So we put fuel and air into the engine, and we light that fuel off and create heat. The heat creates pressure. The engine converts the pressure into the forces that we know as horsepower and torque. That horsepower and torque in turn drives the wheels and propels the car down the road. Okay, But only a little more than a third of the heat that we create actually gets turned into usable force. Where's the other two-thirds go? Most of it goes into the cooling system, and what doesn't goes out the tailpipe. So, the cooling system is made up of a bunch of different components. Everybody knows we've got a radiator and a fan and a water pump and a thermostat and a radiator cap. But not everybody knows how those components work. So, what I'd like to do is, is kind of break these videos down into uh, individual segments and today what we're going to talk about is the thermostat in particular. Alright, so the first thing we have to know if we're going to talk about thermostats is what temperature do we want this engine to run? And I, I'm going to just throw this out there to begin with. An optimum temperature for a small block Ford is between 180 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's optimum. If you're running anywhere in that range, the engine is going to properly atomize the fuel and um, you'll end up with a nice homogeneous mixture. You're going to get a good complete burn. You won't be experiencing issues with pre-ignition due to hot spots in the, uh, the combustion chambers or on the pistons. The engine is going to run really well in that temperature range. So why not cooler? Well, if we run 
much below 180 degrees. We start getting below 170 in the 160, 150 range. That's so cold that the fuel doesn't atomize fully and you can't get that homogeneous mixture in the chamber. So we, we lose our homogeneous vapor and we end up with droplets that, that come in from the carburetor through the intake valve. Uh, those droplets will swirl around the, the cylinder, attach themselves to the cylinder wall, and wipe the oil off of your cylinder walls. Where's that oil go? Well, it gets picked back up, thrown onto the top of the piston, splattered all over the combustion chamber where it creates carbon. At the same time, because it wasn't on the cylinder wall, it allows the top of the cylinder to wear excessively, and it allows the, the compression rings to wear excessively. So it shortens the life of the engine and you end up with an engine that doesn't have as much compression as it should. Cold temperatures for these engines are bad, okay? We really don't want temperatures under about 165, 170 degrees. We want these engines to warm up as quickly as possible. And that's how we're gonna reduce the amount of wear that we're dealing with, okay? The opposite end of that, Okay, if we get over 210 in our, our 180 to 210 range, we start getting above 210, we have kind of a buffer zone from about 210 to 225. That's the, I'm, I'm working the car really hard and I need to back off, okay? Um, once we cross 225, 230, now we're in kind of a dangerous territory. We start reaching the point where the pressure of the system and the blend of the coolant can no longer prevent the coolant from boiling. And it's not gonna boil in the radiator like most people think. It's gonna boil in the cylinder heads and at the top of the cylinders. The minute you end up with the coolant flashing to a gas inside the engine, it's going to create giant pressure surges and force coolant out of the radiator and you're gonna have a coolant loss. Well, that sucks because if you're driving, you end up with coolant on the back tires, and that's like driving on ice. Um, if you have a recovery bottle or a, a uh, even just a catch bottle, um, hopefully you don't exceed the capacity of that, that container for your overflow coolant. Um, if you do, again, the coolant gets on the back tires and you're going to be skating around. It's actually kind of terrifying. If you've never had coolant on your rear tires, I, I can assure you it's not something you want to experience unless you've got some real good skills with car control and zero traction. Um, the whole idea here is we want to prevent the car from boiling over or, or overheating. And to do that, we have to make sure that we're getting heat out of the coolant. How do we do that? Well, we need the coolant to stay still in the radiator for, for a, a bit of time so that the radiator can do its job. The part that makes that happen is the thermostat. And this is the thermostat out of my Shelby. Uh, this is just a standard stock type replacement thermostat. And on the back, it's stamped 160, and that 160 means it's a 160 degree thermostat. Now, a little history on this car, back in the late 80s and up to the mid 90s when this car was still being driven, this car never got used in the hotter months. If it was more than about 90 degrees outside, this car would overheat. This is the culprit, okay? This is the starting point of the overheating. Why? Well. Once you're over 160 degrees and you can't get under 160 degrees, this thermostat stays open and the coolant just flows continuously. Now our coolant never stops in the radiator, takes a break and gets the heat out. Our coolant doesn't stop in the engine long enough to take a break and pull the heat out of the engine. So we've lost that thermal transfer cycle that we need to be able to keep this engine cool. So what's the fix? The fix is we're gonna 
take a line item out of the late model Mustang playbook. Ford answered this for us. And most manufacturers did, okay? The solution is a higher temperature thermostat. You look at a 87 to 95 Fox or early SM95 Mustang with a 5 liter HO engine in it. Those cars all had 192 degree thermostats from the factory. And when I started out in this industry, and those cars were new cars, uh, people would say, man, these cars run hot. And your chip manufacturers would sell computer chips that you could plug into the cars that uh, were sold with thermostats. A lot of times with 160 degree thermostats to try and trick the sensors into enriching the car to try and keep the car running cooler. And they rarely worked, okay? They would work in cool weather, the car would make more power, but in, in warm weather, the, the cars would actually run hotter. And there would be zero gain from these chips and lower temperature thermostats. Uh, you know, cars that had electric fans, they would sell a lower temperature fan switch to turn the fan on earlier in conjunction with the lower temperature thermostat and the chip. And they would try and use the extra airflow of the fan being on more to kind of band-aid fix what little they knew about tuning computerized engines back then. It was a mess. There's just no other way of putting it. It was a mess. Um, the late 80s through the late 90s were kind of the the wild west of of engine tuning and I lived and experienced those years uh, I got to learn some hard lessons in that time and some of those lessons are what brought me to my understanding of cooling systems today that's how I know that we want to put a 195 degree thermostat in a 1966 289 hypo because this thermostat is going to give the stock radiator the time it needs to remove the heat from the coolant so that when the thermostat does open, the coolant that's in the radiator is nice and cool. It goes in, cools down the engine block, cools down the cylinder heads, closes this thermostat, and stops the hot coolant in the radiator so that the cycle can repeat. And we want that cycle to repeat continuously. Cool down the, the fluid, send it to the engine, warm it back up. When it reaches a, a, a warm temperature, this, the coolant that's in the radiator has cooled back down. We send the hot coolant back to the radiator and we start the process all over again. Now, that process can happen relatively quickly or it can be happening on a fairly slow cycle every minute, minute and a half. It depends on the vehicle to some extent. It also depends largely on the thermostat. Now, this particular thermostat is a flow cooler Robert Shaw 195 degree model. And it, it's a high flow style, so it has a much larger opening in the front and then the back of the thermostat, the whole back moves back. Um, it's not a flat plate valve like a stock type thermostat. So this thing is designed to move the coolant through it in greater quantity. And that actually works to our advantage because we've chosen our water pump that's going to move coolant at a reasonable pace. We want to be able to cycle that coolant quickly out of the engine, get the cool stuff in, and dump the hot stuff in the radiator so that the hot coolant can drop its temperature. And we want this to close. That's the important part. We want this to close and pause the cycle, okay? The 160 degree thermostat never pauses the cycle above 160 degrees. So, 
Thermostats are really important to the operation of the cooling system. They're probably the most important part to the operation of the cooling system, and they kind of get overlooked. People will buy cheap stock type thermostats. You can do research online and you really won't find good articles and good information about thermostats. You can find out on YouTube how to put it in a pot of boiling water and make sure it opens at the temperature it's supposed to open at. Um, you'll get advice to only use OEM thermostats, but you really won't get the understanding of thermostats that I'm trying to convey to you here today because, well, two reasons. Most guys don't know how these things work, how the cooling system works. Most guys don't think about cooling systems this way because they're not building performance cars. The other thing that's holding back this technology and this information is you've got companies selling radiators, selling fans, selling water pumps, and they're trying to sell you a part that's going to fix your problem. They don't want to tell you that the thermostat's your problem. They don't want to tell you that just change your thermostat and you won't need to put a water pump on it. Just change the thermostat. You won't need a double electric fan that moves 3,000 CFM. Just change the thermostat and you won't need a radiator that requires you to cut the radiator support out of the car. Okay, This information doesn't get shared and the big manufacturers of parts don't want to tell you this because cooling systems are big business. Guys like you and I spend a lot of money on these cars. We spend a lot of money annually on cooling systems. And sure, there's always going to be a need to put radiators in cars. There's always going to be a need for replacement fans, replacement water pumps, thermostats, radiator caps, coolant recovery bottles, all of the parts of the cooling system. There's always going to be a need for those parts. But in the automotive aftermarket, the, the, way, the way we're trying to sell you these parts, and I say we because I did it for years, I sold parts. We're going to try and convince you, the automotive aftermarket is going to try and convince you that our part is the best solution to your problem, and you should buy our part. It will solve your problem. Okay, I have personally battled cooling systems using the best parts out there, and it wasn't until later in my career that I realized I battled this guy. This was the problem the whole time. It was just a thermostat issue. The thermostat never closed. The thermostat wasn't doing its job. I couldn't get the car to cool down, or the truck. So, with that, um, I think I've pretty much covered thermostats in a way that I hope it makes you think about your cooling system and your choices on your cooling system before you before you start pointing the finger and blaming the, the radiator is the problem, the fan's the problem, the water pump's the problem. You know, if these parts aren't physically damaged, you know, cracked fan, leaking water pump, leaking radiator, if they're not physically bad and they're doing their job, chances are the problem is your thermostat. So I hope the video so far has brought you to a different way of thinking about your cooling system. And if you liked this information, the next video will be on radiators and I will give you some of the, the technical understanding that you need to be able to choose the right radiator without breaking the bank, without having to necessarily modify your car to fit it to it. Um, so if you liked the video, um, please like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and uh, turn on subscriptions. Uh, I would 
really like to have you come back and uh, join me for the next couple of videos in this series. I think it's a lot of information that will really appeal to anyone who's kind of on the edge with their cooling system. Uh, if you have more questions, you can also reach me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, the links for both of those are going to be in the description below. And with that, I thank you for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.